everybody. I'm so excited about today. So thank you for joining us on our Come Follow Me study here at spiritualcrusade.com. My name is Debbie and today we are studying Jacob 1 through 4 and I'm actually really excited about today because there are some testimony scriptures in chapter 4 that are just like my favorite, like all-time favorite. So, and I say that a lot about Wow, let me try that again. I say that about a lot of scriptures, but I really do love these, you guys. So the title in the Come Follow Me book is Be Reconciled Unto God Through the Atonement of Christ. And that's really what today's message is all about. He is going to pull out and talk about some of the sins that have crept in among the people. But really, he's trying to point them back to Christ. That's like all the message from the prophets and apostles from of our day and in the past. That's always the message is to point us back to our Savior. And so I love this idea of be reconciled unto God through the atonement of Christ. Now Craig's ponder, no, yeah, ponder a scripture is on this exact um, scripture. It's Jacob 4, 11. So go to spiritualcrusade.com and he will expound on this, teach us a little bit about this. And then you can also download the picture to your phone and uh, memorize it and ponderize it all week long. So, um, so that's fun. We are going to talk about Jacob's testimony first because I just, I love his testimony so much. I know it's in chapter four, but there's a little bit in one and a little bit in four. And we're going to hit on that first because it's just like, it's just my favorite. And then we're going to get into his conference talk. He's going to gather the people and he's going to teach them. And he has two topics he's going to talk to them about. And we're going to talk about those. Um, and then we're going to touch a little bit on the pure in heart at the end. Because um, he teaches us, uh, he talks specifically to the pure in heart. So it's fun to kind of pull those verses out as well. Um, so 55 years have passed since Lehi took his family and left Jerusalem. And we see that in verse 1. Now, a lot has happened in those 55 years. Um, if you guys remember, they left as a family. Lehi and his family left first, and then they went back and got wives, and then they began to grow a little bit, and then um, Lehi dies, and the contention between Laman and Lemuel and Nephi and Sam continues. And it's not, it's not pretty, you know? It's always kind of, kind of bad because they always want to kill him. So um, at some point, Nephi takes those that want to go with him and he separates off and onto his own. So now we have these two groups called the Nephites and the Lamanites. Now Jacob in verse 14 is going to kind of teach, like expound on that a little bit, how they really, well in 13 he tells us that there were lots of little groups, but he distinguishes them in two main groups. And I'll just read it. It says, but I, Jacob, shall not hereafter distinguish them by these names, speaking of the names that he had given in verse 13, because there were lots of them. You got Nephites, Jacobites, Josephites, Zoramites, Lamanites, Lemuelites, Ishmaelites. But he's like, I'm not going to distinguish them by all these names. But I shall call them Lamanites that seek to destroy the people of Nephi. And those who are friendly to Nephi, I shall call Nephites, or the people of Nephi, according to the reign of the kings. So in this 55 years, we went from one family to now two separate groups. And we see that there's lots of different groups, but we are going to distinguish them as the Lamanites and the Nephites because that's the way that Jacob distinguishes them. Now we also see in these chapters that sin has crept in. So he is going to call the people together. And he has been set apart and consecrated. And you see that in verses um, 8. Um, he and Jacob and Joseph both. It says, For I, Jacob, and my brother Joseph have been consecrated priests and teachers of this people by the hand of Nephi. So they are consecrated and set apart to be priests, priests and teachers. So he's going to gather the people and he's going to give us this conference talk today, which is awesome and it's so powerful. Um, and he speaks so boldly. Um, so a lot has crept in. So we've got sin, we've got the separation of the people, a lot has happened. Um, but I just want to, first of all, this is kind of a tangent, but I just have to say it. If you think about Jacob and Joseph, Lehi said they were born in the days of his tribulation. Do you guys remember that from, I don't even remember what verse that, or what chapter that was in. I should have looked it up before I started, but this is an unplanned tangent. Um, they, so anyway, he had said that they were born in the, um, the days of his tribulation. And I remember we, my, when my husband, he went to law school, but he did an MBA law school combination. So I ended up being um, four years instead of three. And we had two kids during that time. <laughs> And I remember my husband saying something about, um, you know, Sadie and Daniel born in the days of our tribulation. They are such a joy. And I look at um, Jacob and Joseph and what joy they must have brought their family. So I don't know. Children are such a joy no matter when they come. <laughs> Even if they come in the really hard times of our lives, they are such a joy. And you can see that because, I mean, 
Le Lehi had left his comfort and his like, you know, posterity, headed into this wilderness with nothing, and then he has these two children, and look, look at what a blessing they are. They've done so much. Um, okay, so there's a few things I want us to notice when we read Jacob's words. This is so important. Before we get into the testimony, he really wants us to know that he's only going to write what he finds to be most precious, and that's in verse 2. It says, he gave, and he gave, um, speaking of Nephi, Nephi gave Jacob a commandment that I should write into these plates a few of the things which I consider to be most precious. So as you're reading Jacob's words, pay attention to the things that are most precious. Um, he also in verse 4 goes on to say, And if there were preachings which were sacred, or revelation which was great, or prophesying, that I should engrave in the heads of them upon these plates and touch upon them as much as it were possible for the Christ's sake and for the sake of our people. So we're going to see the preachings that were sacred, the sacred, the revelation that was great, the prophesying, the ones that he found of most importance, most precious is what he is going to spend his time writing in these plates. Now, his testimony is so beautiful. If you guys remember, Jacob has seen his Savior. He has seen him. And he is going to testify of him in a real and powerful way. So if you guys remember back in 2 Nephi 10, 3, Nephi says, And my brother Jacob also has seen him, speaking of our Savior, as I have seen him. In verse 2, he had just finished saying that Isaiah had seen his Redeemer. And then he says, Jacob also has seen him. So Jacob has seen his Savior and Redeemer. And he is going to testify of him in such a real way. In verse 6, he says, we knew of Christ and his kingdom, which should come. We knew of Christ and his kingdom, which should come. I just think this is so powerful. Um, later, he says in verse 8, he says, Wherefore, we would to God that we could persuade all men not to rebel against God. He is really going to teach his people stop rebelling against God. Um, continue on, he says, to provoke him to anger, but that all men would believe in Christ and view his death and suffer his cross and bear the shame of the world. Wherefore I, Jacob, take it upon me to fulfill the commandment of my brother Nephi. So he is going to take this upon himself in a real way to teach his people about his Savior and Redeemer, who he has seen personally and will testify of. But not only is he going to testify of Jesus Christ in word, but he is going to write and to testify of Jesus Christ in his writings. And we can see in chapter 4 how hard this was for them. And this is why I love these verses so much, you guys. This is the part of Jacob 4 that I just love so much because I can see it. It makes it real for me. Like I can envision how hard this must have been for them to write. Let's read them because they're like my favorite. Now behold, it came to pass that I, Jacob, having ministered much unto my people in word, like we said, he was testifying in word, and I cannot write but a little of my words because of the difficulty of engraving our words upon plates. And it's in parentheses. He's like, I, he, they, I, don't, I, I don't even know what that looks like. I'm going to be honest. I don't know how hard it was to write on these plates. But you can see that it was difficult. Like for me, when I think of them like, writing Isaiah's words straight from I, you know, their plates to these plates, I'm like, that's a lot of writing. It must not have been hard, right? He's like, no, it was really difficult. So I cannot write but a little of my words because of the difficulty of engraving our words upon plates. And we know that the things which we write upon plates must remain. And I love that he's like going to teach us here a little bit about the plates and why they wrote on the plates, why they use the gold plates. But whatsoever things we write upon anything, save it be upon plates, must perish and vanish away. But we, but we can write a few words upon plates which will give our children and also our beloved brethren a small degree of knowledge concerning us or concerning their fathers. I love these verses so much. And it's going to continue. They're not done yet. But I just love envisioning, like, this was hard work. Anything else they wrote their words on, they knew that they would vanish away. So they're like, we are going to engrave in. <laughs> and even just that word sounds hard. We are going to engrave in all these words. All of the things that they write, are. it was difficult for them to write it, right? Let's move on. Now, in this thing, we do rejoice. Ah, isn't that so beautiful? And we labor diligently to engrave in these words upon plates. So here, they he's just finished saying this is so hard. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is difficult to write, and so we can only write a little bit. But he's like, but we rejoice in this thing. In this hardship, we rejoice. This brings us joy. You know what? This is, <laughs> this is a little off topic, but something that's hard to do that can bring us just as much joy is stuff like genealogy, missionary work. Anything in the gospel pretty much falls into this category, actually. <laughs> like, it's hard to do. Even ministering, you know, especially when you're ministering to someone who doesn't like it. There are so many things that are hard to do. But I love to see how he's like, in this we do rejoice. It might be super difficult, but we rejoice. And we labor diligently to do it, right? Like, this is where we put our effort because we know how important this is. And that's our lives. Whatever it is in our lives that we're like, yeah, this is really difficult. But it's the work of the Lord, and it's important. So we're going to labor with all of our might, might, mind, and soul, and we're going to rejoice. Well, we should, but we, it's not always like, woo, we got rejected. <laughs> when we try to share the gospel, that's fun. Like, it's not always like super, like, we don't always feel like we rejoice. But the work is so beautiful. It is so beautiful, you guys. And as we do diligently labor, we find that joy. We find it even when we are rejected or even when we spend hours on genealogy and we don't find anything. Like we find the joy in it as we do it. It's so beautiful. Okay, so he, I love this. I love how this is so hard and yet he does it anyway. Okay, so here we are. Now in this thing we do rejoice and we labor diligently to engrave in these words upon plates, hoping, this is the why. Why do we do it? Hoping that our beloved brethren and our children will receive them with thankful heart and look upon them that they may learn with joy and not with sorrow, neither with contempt concerning their first parents. Oh, that's so good. He is saying, this is why we're doing this. This is the work that we're doing. We're going to labor with all of our might to engrave in these things because we, we know that at some point it will be great worth to them. Oh, it's going to go on. This is the testimony I love so much. For for this intent have we written these things, that they may know that we knew of Christ. And we had a hope of his glory many hundred years before his coming. And not only we ourselves had a hope of his glory, but also all the holy prophets which were before us. And I love this part in verse 5. Behold, they believed in Christ and worshipped the Father in his name. And also we worship the Father in his name. That is one of my favorite testimonies. I love it so much. You guys, I have referred back to that testimony both in teachings and, and for myself so many times in my life. I love this. I love how he says, we knew of Christ. That's why they wrote this. They wanted us and they wanted their beloved brethren and their children to know they knew of Christ. They knew he lived. He is a personal witness of his Savior, Jesus Christ. And I just love how he says, not only we, not just me and my brethren, like all the holy prophets be before us. Christ lives. He is real and we know him, right? Um, and then you're going to jump down and you're going to see the power that comes from this incredible faith, okay? Um, let's go to six. Wherefore, we search the prophets. So they've searched the words of the prophets just as we do. We search the words of the prophets and we have many revelations in the spirit of prophecy and, of, and having all these witnesses, not just our own, but all the witnesses, we obtain a hope and our faith becometh unshaken. It is not moved. They have unshaken faith in so much that we truly can command in the name of Jesus, the very trees obey us, or the mountains, or the waves of the sea. Their faith is so great and so unshaken that they can command the elements. But here's the thing that I love about this testimony so much. And this is going to go back a little bit to our last week's lesson, where Nephi talks about his weakness a little bit. Listen to these words. This is so good. Nevertheless, the Lord showeth us our weakness, that we may know that it is by his grace and his great condescensions unto the children of men that we have power to do these things. You guys, <laughs> here is a man who can command the elements. And yet he says, the Lord shows me my weaknesses. My weaknesses are in front of me. Even though I can command the elements and they'll obey me because of my unshaken, unshaken faith, I am still shown my weakness. Now, if this man was shown his weakness, of course we're shown our weaknesses. We all have weaknesses and, we're, and they're like screaming at us in our faces, right? 
But I love how he says that it is because we see our weaknesses that we're constantly turned back to our Savior. We constantly know that it is by His grace that we're able to have the power to do these things. They can't, I love that they're like, we're not going to boast in and of ourselves. We're not going to stand up in here and say, we're so great we can command the elements. He's like, no, we're not, we're not commanding the elements. It is because of the grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that if needs be, we needed to do this, which they're not just doing it for fun, but if needs be, we could do these things by His grace and His power. Isn't that so good? So, okay, so I don't know. These are like my favorite. When I think about Jacob's testimony every time, I'm just like, oh, it's so good. And I, I literally love teaching it. I love going back and studying it. It's just my favorite, you guys. It's my favorite. Okay, so that's a little bit more. I could go on all day, but we gotta keep moving. So let's talk about the sins that he's gonna call. He's gonna call out their sins, okay? So first he gathers the people together and he's gonna stand up. Um, before he jumps in, he's gonna really, I want you guys to pay attention to the words he's gonna use because he's really gonna let us know how hard this topic is for him. So in verse two, we see, we see um, soberness. Three, we see weighed down. And he's gonna say, he's gonna use the word anxiety. Um, but I this day am weighed down with much more desire and anxiety for the welfare of your souls that I have hitherto been. So more than in the past, today I am weighed down because of you guys' sins. And in six, it grieveth my soul and causeth me to shrink with shame. Okay, just pay attention to those words. Weighed down, shrink with, sh with shame, grieveth my soul. He says again in seven, grieveth me. Um, and then there's more. Sorry, I can't turn my page. Um, and nine, he says, burden it, it burdeneth my soul. So these words, you can tell this is a really hard, hard topic for him. Not just because of the topic, but because who it's going to affect. And here he's going to begin to say there are many that are pure in heart. So I guess we're going to kind of switch, switch these because we're going to talk about pure in heart first. But here he's going to talk about how this is hard for me because there are many of you that came today to hear the pleasing word of God. And I love how with the pleasing word of God, he says in verse 8, and it supposes me that they come up hither to hear the pleasing word of God, yea, the word which healeth the wounded soul. Isn't that what conference is all about? Isn't that what we get so excited about conference? Or isn't that why we get so excited about conference? So we can hear the pleasing word of God and be uplifted and strengthened. And like, I mean, we just look forward to it and we're like, oh, it's going to give us the wings to fly for the next six months. And we're going to get all the, all, you know, questions answered that we have and the brokenness that we feel is going to be healed. And we just like, conference is so edifying and uplifting, right? And he's very understanding. He's like, there are many of you who have come today to hear that part, to hear the pleasing word of God and to be uplifted and strengthened strengthened. He's like, but I, that's not the message I can give. And that's really hard on him. It's really hard on him. And so, um, he and he says this in 10, but notwithstanding the greatness of the task, I must, I must do according to the strict commands of God and tell you concerning your wickedness and abominations in the presence of the pure in heart and the broken heart and under the glance of the piercing eye of the almighty God. So even this is so hard for me, and even in front of the broken heart and the pure in heart who came to be strengthened and uplifted, I still need to share this message with you. Um, so we are actually going to jump to pure in heart first and then come back to his teachings because we're already here. If you guys will go with me to three, he's going to spend a few minutes talking to them, which I love. He's going to come back and he's going to say, this is what I have to say for you that are pure in heart. Um, chapter, chapter three, verse one and two. But behold, I, Jacob, would speak unto you that are pure in heart, Look unto God with firmness. You guys, I want you to pay attention to the action words, okay? The action words that he wants you guys to do, and then this is what your Savior is going to do for you, okay? So look unto God. So we've got look with firmness of mind and pray unto him with exceeding faith. Now here's what he will do for you. And he will console you in your afflictions. So he's going to console you. And he will plead your cause, which is one of my very favorite things to think about. He will plead your cause right? And send down justice upon those who seek your destruction. So there's three things that he's saying, your Savior Jesus Christ will console you, he will plead your cause, and he will send down justice upon those who seek, to, for, um, those who seek your destruction. But I just love that he, we have this like, look, 
Look unto him with firmness of mind, and this is what he will provide for you, okay? But he's going to give us a few more action words in, in two. Oh, all you that are pure in heart, lift up your heads. So now we have look, we have pray, we have lift. Lift up your heads and receive the pleasing word of God. And feast, that's another one. Feast. Um, is that five? Look, pray, lift. Oh, I put receive as one. Receive the pleasing word of God and feast upon his love. For ye may, if your minds are firm forever. Isn't that so beautiful? Um, he is going to contrast that. In verses 3, he's going to begin to talk to those who are not pure in heart. But that's for another. That's for after we talk about the, the sins. So for those who, who did come seeking strengthening, he's like, look to your Lord and your Savior. Lift up your heads. Seek his pleasing word of God. Isn't it so good? Okay, so to these, to these two topics that we have, both pride and the chastity topic, um, with the pride one, let's go to 13, okay? Well, in 12, he starts to say you're seeking riches. You're out there looking for gold and for silver and for all manner of precious golds and then, uh, or of precious ores. And then in 13, he says, um, that ye, may, that ye have obtained many riches, and because some of you have obtained more abundantly than that of your brethren, you are lifted up in pride, in the pride of your hearts, and wear stiff necks and high heads because of the costliness of your peril, and persecute your brethren because ye suppose ye are better than they. If you guys cross references to 21, the last sentence, he says, and the one being is as precious in his sight as the other. So God sees them equal. God sees them all precious equally, right? But they're starting to think that they're better than another, that they can lift themselves up. Um, but, but then he's going to give us the difference. The, he's going to differentiate riches that are used for good things and riches that are used for bad. He's already given us the bad. When you, you know, lift up your heads and you become prideful and you separate yourselves and think you're better than others. And then he's going to give us this one in 18 and 19. But before you seek for riches, seek ye for the kingdom of God. And after you have obtained a hope in Christ, ye shall obtain riches if you seek them. And you will seek them for the intent to do good. And I love this because he's saying there is a difference here. Seeking them to separate yourselves and lift yourselves up in pride or seeking to do good. Continuing on, he says, to clothe the naked and to feed the hungry and to liberate the captive and administer relief to the sick and the afflicted. So here he has given us a difference. Rich, um, money in and of itself is not bad. But how we use it and how we treat others when we have it or don't have it, or, you know, are we shunning and lifting ourselves up and like, you're, you're less than me? Or are we feeding the sick and the hungry? Are we reaching out and seeking? I love how he uses the word, you will seek them for the intent to do good, to clothe the naked, to feed the hungry. Like, oh, so good. So he gives us the difference. So then he goes on to say, I wish this was the worst sin. I wish I could stop here. I wish that we could just be done with this, right? He says this in 22. And were it not that I must speak unto you concerning a grosser crime, my heart would rejoice exceedingly because of you. I wish that this was all it was, and then I could just rejoice in you. So in 23, he says, but the word of God burdens my soul because of your grosser crimes. This next crime I'm going to talk to you guys about is even worse, and it's hard for me to talk to you about it. Now, the Lord wants a righteous branch, and he is going to have a righteous branch. And Jacob is going to warn the Nephites. He is speaking to the Nephites, and he is warning them, if you do not repent, the land will be taken from you and will be given to the Lamanites. Because the Lord will have a righteous branch. Let's read it, okay? Wherefore, thus saith the Lord, I have led this people forth out of the land of Jerusalem. I have led you guys out from Jerusalem by the power of mine arm, that I might raise up a righteous branch from the fruit of the loins of Joseph. So he's like, I will not let you guys do what they've done of old. I have led you out by the um, hand of, by my power, out from Jerusalem. And I will have a righteous branch. And he goes on, and how he's and here's the warning, okay? He says, um, in four, and the time speedily cometh, and this is chapter three, verse four, that except you repent, they, the Lamanites, shall possess the land of your inheritance. 
and the Lord God will lead away the righteous out from among you. And he did that to Lehi. When Jerusalem got distor- got wicked, he led Lehi out. So he will lead out the righteous. But all in all, you will lose your inheritance if you continue with this sin. Um, and he's warning them in a very real way. He's like, this is an abomination and the Lord needs a righteous branch. So be that righteous branch and repent. So, and accept you repent, just like it says in this verse, um, they shall possess the land. Let's talk about the Lamanites for a second. Um, in 35 of chapter 2, it says, Behold, ye have done greater iniquities than the Lamanites, our brethren. Ye have broken the hearts of your tender wives and lost the confidence of your children because of your bad example before them. And the sobbings of their hearts ascend up to God against you. The sobbings of their hearts ascend up to God against you. And because of the strictness of the word of God, which cometh down against you, many hearts died, pierced with deep wounds. There is so much boldness there. He is not messing around. There is so much boldness. Um, And then again in verse 5, he says, and this is of chapter 3, Behold, the Lamanites, your brethren, whom ye hate, later down in that verse, he says, are more righteous than you. Later on, further down, he says that they should have save it were one wife and concubines they should have none and there should not be whoredoms committed among them. And now, and th- this is verse six, and now this commandment they observe to keep. Wherefore, because of this observance in keeping this commandment, the Lord God will not destroy them, but will be merciful unto them. And one day they shall become a blessed people. Verse seven, behold, their wives love their, their husbands love their wives and their wives love their husbands and their husbands and their wives love their children. So basically he's warning them, this is a grave sin and you can lose it all. We, you, you know, we can lose the inheritance and the land and everything um, if you don't repent. So be reconciled unto God through the atonement of Christ. Come back to your Savior, Jesus Christ. He's gonna point them to their Savior. He's always pointing them back to the Savior. Repent, repent and be that righteous branch the Lord needs you to be, right? Okay, moving on really quickly. He is gonna introduce chapter five. Chapter five is awesome. It's so awesome. It's all about the olive tree. Um, it is so good. It's, it's deep, and, but it's so good. And we're gonna be talking about that next week. But he's gonna introduce that in chapter four, verses 14 through 18. And he's gonna to begin to talk about the Jews and um, how that they, in verse 15, how they have rejected the stone, says the Jews, they will reject the stone upon which they might build and have safe foundation. And then 17 and 18, he's gonna ask this question. He says, and now my, be- my, beloved, my, my beloved, sorry, let me start over. And now my beloved, how is it possible that these, the Jews, after having rejected the sure foundation, can ever build upon it, that it may become the head of their corner? This is the question, okay? That's a very important question. He's gonna say, behold, my beloved brethren, I will unfold this mystery unto you, if I do not by any means get shaken from my firmness in the spirit and stumble because of my over anxiety for you. Dun, dun, dun. We are going to learn the answer to that question next week. He's like, I will unfold the mystery to you. I'm going to teach you how it's all going to play out, okay? And it's going to be awesome. So we're going to see the answer to that question in chapter 5 next week. So, so exciting. So much more to come. I hope we see you guys again next week. Thank you for coming. See you again.